things that we'd like to cover uh, just to get familiar with the definitions and the types of technical standards that are available. Uh, we have some major standards databases that we have available here, and we'd like to make sure that you're aware of them. Um, we'd like to help you develop effective standards searching strategies and to understand the basic structure of technical standards. So hopefully when we get to uh, Hao Yang's uh, part of the presentation, he'll be actually be able to show you some technical standards themselves as we use some of our resources. So when we define a standard, you can use a standard definition like what's on the screen there. And uh, sometimes it just helps to bring out a couple of examples. And one just showed up on the radio this morning that was kind of interesting how they would like to develop some national standards on um, charging units for electric vehicles. So there we go. There's a standards in development right then and there. And I'm sure that there are already some proposed ones on the table. So it's uh, interesting to see that that's one good example of a standard that is good to promote an industry. If, if all the manufacturers of charging stations are interchangeable as far as what vehicle they will charge, you can see that that's a major gain. Another historical reference to a standard would be the standard gauge of a railroad. How far put they far how far apart they put the rails of a uh, of a railroad, and you can understand that in the early days when there wasn't a standard, people were were generating train tracks for their economic region of the country in the United States anyway, and. Uh, they would often try to use that to the advantage of their particular region, and they didn't care what other people were doing until their users started demand up. Well, here I am in Buffalo, and I need to get to San Francisco. How are you going to get me there without changing trains every, you know, 100 miles or so? So these are the kind of things that are often driven by uh, uh, necessity. Um, certain things like safety can be a concern or tolerances as far as this particular uh, product has to be built in a certain way in order to make sure that it's safe. And sorry about that, needed a little bit of a lubrication there. Uh, and so you can see that uh, probably examples are a better way to define a standard. And the whole idea of standards, they can be broken down into different types. And there are just so many ways to do this. Uh, these are just a few examples, and, and so it could be uh, by the type of standard, by being a, whether it's a product or a service, a process or a management standard. So a typical product might be something like an electric vehicle charger, um, a standard gauge for a railroad. It could be a process, like I know some of the uh, ISO standards, they have certain processes in place or their management standards are rather rather uh, famous as far as you know are you is your company ISO certified you know it's a, it's a very important way to break down the standards they could also be uh, a formal standard that's blessed off by some organization like the American National Standards Institute they could be an informal standard that you know we often call that de facto something that becomes so common it just everybody does it uh, it could be a proprietary standard, something that is a particular way a company produces a product. And in that case, rather than sharing that standard, they might have technical specifications that they're willing to share with clients. Yet another breakdown might be whether it's a current, a historical, or a redline type standard. And by that, I mean a current standard would be one that would be currently being used. A historical standard might be an earlier version of a standard, and those can be very important, uh, at least in my experiences. Um, early on in my career, I was at the University of South Carolina, and all of the local law firms would come to the university to look at historical standards literature because they needed to know what the standard was at the time uh, a particular structure was built or a product was made because they were in litigation over somebody getting hurt or something like that. 
Uh, you can see that where the historical standards can come into play. And it all depends on what your work is and what you need to deal with. So you might be somebody that's redesigning something and you need to know what the standards were at the time that it was uh, originally created. So you never know what you're, you're going to be facing in your careers. Um, and then the red line standards. Uh, we found that there are a lot of faculty and uh, postdocs and and maybe returning students from industry that may be involved with the promulgation or creation of standards. And these are things, so this, the red line standards are basically those drafts that show what the proposed changes are going to be. Um, we could subscribe to those, but at Carnegie Mellon, we have not done so. So that, that's a very important thing to realize. You'll be able to get at the current standards. We can we can order you historical standards if need be, uh, but to realize that red line standards might exist, we found that uh, typically we just like the community to be involved with standards uh, creation. And so this is a way of gaining access to the red line standards. People involved with creating them are certainly going to have access to them, usually from the uh, standards development organization, the, the organization that actually produces them. Okay. And just a general question, uh, more of a trivia thing. Uh, this, what you see on the screen right now are, let's see if I can pull this out of the way. These are basically placards. Uh, they look like they're aluminum and they're actually in the floor of one of our buildings on campus. And can any of you possibly guess as to where they're at? Ah, very good, Linda. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they are in the Mellon Institute in what I like to call the, the Batman lobby. Uh, it's basically the fourth floor of the Mellon Institute right in front of the Mellon Institute library. There's that big uh, open area, like a great space. And uh, it appeared in the one Batman movie. And along the edges of that room, you'll find all of these uh, uh, placards in the floor. And, and uh, my wife was with me when we were visiting them. And just, she decided to take a picture of every single one and sent them my way. So you can see some of the standard development organizations that are common, uh, like the American Society for Testing and Materials. The American Ceramic Society and the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Let me see here. <laughs> Linda spent a lot of time there getting her degree. Okay, very good. <laughs> so you might be wondering who in the world creates all these standards? And so some of the ones that are more uh, prominent here at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Ones that if you're in engineering and science and even uh, like uh, uh, architecture, uh, you might run into these. Uh, so these are basically all of these organizations are involved with producing standards. Some of them work with uh, like an umbrella organization called ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, and they get further ANSI approval on their standards. So. Uh, these are the kind of things that you'll run, in, run across quite a bit. There are certain digital collections of these standards that we have carefully uh, arranged over the years for access by our constituents. And I'll try to point those out here in a bit. Um, so some of them you might uh, be very familiar with already. Uh, just a couple of examples. I mentioned the American Society for Testing and Materials, very common uh, whenever you have like test methods or ways of producing a particular material, whether it's a, a tile or a, or basically anything uh, that you run into, uh, a jersey barrier, there are standards for producing those. Um, uh, from there, you also have things like the International Code Council. They, they basically were the old BOCA codes now in a modern organization that handles things on an international uh, basis, including building codes. So our civil engineers and our um, uh, School of Architecture is very interested in that information. 
And then we have things like underwriter laboratories, just about any kind of an electronic gizmo that you plug into your wall has this strange little tag on the cord and it has uh, like UL, UL approved. Uh, underwriter laboratories does an awful lot of, of approving of standard ways of producing certain types of equipment to make them safer, hopefully. And so we've arranged a number of databases at Carnegie Mellon that uh, we think are very helpful, but we're always on the lookout for other strong possibilities that we should be attaining. Uh, so the first one I'll mention up there is actually the ANSI IBR portal. These are things that are incorporated by reference in the United States Code of Federal Regulations. So if the government mentions them, ANSI provides access to them if they have access themselves. And it's read-only access, but at least you can read the standard. Standards can be kind of expensive. So it's nice to know that there's a link right on the library's research guide to these ANSI, this uh, ANSI IBR portal, where you can check for things that you run into when you might be looking at uh, the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, ASTM Compass is a wonderful database of the ASTM standards and related literature that uh, we provide. Okay. And we'll probably, we'll be showing you uh, where you will gain access to these standards. Um, IEEE Explore, um, it's a nice big set of uh, IEEE uh, produced literature, including the standards that the IEEE puts out. MADCAD, is a collection of standards of interest to architecture and civil engineering, including the ICC codes, things like a LEED certification and um, other things like uh, the uh, ASHRAE standards are in there as well. And so it's something that if you're in those particular areas where you have need to look at them to realize that it's something like MADCAD does exist. <clears throat> The NYSHO standards dealing mostly with information science, and I know we, we have somebody in the I, like the uh, information systems area doing graduate work now. So NYSHO standards are, are something that you're probably going to gain familiar, familiarity with. Similar to standards, and this is just another type of literature very related, we, we have a, a product called Protocols I.O., protocols being more of the laboratory setting where standard methods or at least uh, maybe a novel method, this is how I got my results to work out the way they did. And if you wanted to recreate my work or reproduce it, um, follow this protocol. And so protocols I owe is a database, a shared database of researchers uh, protocols that they put in place. And finally, the SAE Mobilis database uh, includes the ground vehicle standards in our subscription to SAE Mobilis, SAE being the Society for Automotive Engineers. And when they think of automotive, think of things that go along the ground or in the air or in outer space. So uh, uh, we have thought and we would need a little bit of interest and, and uh, um, championing of maybe expanding that to um, um, the, their aeronautical standards. Uh, that's something that we might consider for the university. We don't have that yet, though. Okay. Uh, to stress how standards are so important, they're everywhere. And so just within about 10 minutes walking around my office and in the Sorrells Engineering and Science Library in our lounge, I ran into standards are showing up everywhere. So the from the markers on my whiteboard in my office, uh, it's basically dealt with uh, how to produce these low odor markers, I guess. Uh, to In our lounge, we had a, an instant flow water heater that we don't use anymore, but it would heat our water back in the days when they couldn't figure out how to get us hot water there. Uh, and then our fire extinguisher is a UL listed fire extinguisher. Okay, so both of those are are basically UL standards that uh, uh, we work with here, or that that we uh, live with in our work here. And then finally, in the lower right, you see an 
uh, a pipe, uh, surprisingly uh, coming from vinyl chloride, it's a polyvinyl chloride pipe, and the ASTM standard for producing pipe like that is printed right on the side of the pipe. So these are some of the ways that we we run across um, standards just in our general day-to-day -day lives. This is a great little exercise if you if you need to introduce standards to to youngsters or people that are just growing up uh, it can be a fun way to just explore and look for them. I had a friend that did this with patents as well. You know, products that's just around the house. Amazing how how much. Uh, you, you know, time you can have a kid spend doing that. So kind of fun stuff. Now, the ASTM compass, this is an example of that one uh, pipe that we were looking at. It was just simply a drain pipe in the library's lounge for the staff. Uh, you can see there's the standard right there. And that, how young will introduce you to the ASTM compass here in a little bit. But that's an example of once you know that number, they're pretty easy to look up. Okay. Just to the very front page of the standard, and I'm just going to breeze through that because, again, that's something that how young will uh, run into. How people discover standards. This I thought this was a very important thing to just to discuss in general, just literacy, literature searching in a database like Compendex, which is the Comprehensive Engineering Index. Uh, Compendex actually indexes standards. They did this on purpose because so few good indexes to standards exist. So if you happen to be in the area of engineering and you're looking into any kind of literature, realize that when you search a database like Compendex, uh, you're going to not only get scholarly research articles and conference papers, but it might re um, uh, retrieve uh, interest uh, standards of interest to what you're working on. There could be references to standards in handbooks or specialized encyclopedias or other types of monographs or like how young and I were just uh, at a, in a presentation by a vendor about uh, something called McGraw-Hill Access Engineering. And there was a reference to a standard right in Access Engineering, which is a compilation of a whole bunch of uh, digital handbooks. So sure reasonable place to run into that. There could be just general research articles on the design of a particular product, and they start mentioning the applicable standards right in the design article. You could be discussing things with colleagues or bosses, and, and they mention that there should be a standard in place, and they might actually know it by na name and number. Um, product descriptions, when you're sourcing materials for a design, may mention that they adhere to a particular standard. There could be labels or items on cartons, uh, labels on items or cartons that, that indicate what the standard underlying that thing is. And it's something that, depending on your needs, you may want to look up. And then we also provide access to a standard supplier databases. There's a few that we use, one that we use a lot to acquire standards that we don't already have access to for people is is uh, called Tech Street, okay? Now, I mentioned this guide. It's one of our research guides in the libraries. It's devoted to standards. Um, and uh, I think we'll be sharing the slides with you, but we'll make sure that you get the link to this particular thing. But you can always uh, look it up on the library's website. Uh, you go to our research guides and type in the word standards in the search bar, and you'll be able to find it right away. And so it has hopefully some very uh, helpful information. So certain things like our digital collections are listed there, how to find standards. If you need a standard that we don't own, okay? And hopefully won't need a much, uh, won't, won't have much use for this last tab here much longer, but I, I hope we're turning the corner there. But uh, there were some COVID-19 related standards that they made open access since these things can get rather pricey. And uh, that was a good way to help everybody through that. Okay. And I mentioned that there's literature that is similar. So things like codes, we already mentioned protocols, recommended practices. So things like that. So codes might be the boiler and pressure vessel codes or the International Code Council uh, documents that they produce. 
standard ways of doing things. Okay? They just simply don't call them standards. They call them codes. Uh, same idea. Uh, recommended practices. They may be become a de facto type of standard, you know, just a way to get things done that will ensure some kind of quality, okay? Regulations, uh, regulations typically come from governments. So there's the United States Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR, and there, a lot of there's literature within the, the Code of Federal Regulations are just standard ways of doing things, okay? And they will often call upon standards that exist out in, you know, from all these uh, standards development organizations. So you'll find regulations referring to things like ASTM standards or things like an EPA test method. Uh, there are other organizations that come up with uh, appropriate ways to test materials. And in this case, the test methods for the EPA, how do you sample air or water or pollution okay, or soil? Okay. Technical spe specifications may be more coming from uh, a company that has technical specifications for a product, or it could be the Department of Defense is another very uh, uh, noted uh, entity that produces technical specifications that we need to know about. Okay. Well, just to get you thinking beyond just what is traditionally known of known as a standard. Okay. And so we don't want you to feel alone after this. We know that you, you can't learn everything in an, in an hour when it comes to, to standards of literature, but we do make ourselves available. And so you can see our contact information there or go to the library's website and uh, there's a, an ask link to ask a, a question. Okay. And I guess at this point, I'm going to stop share and let How Young get set up. And does anybody have any questions at this time? All right, so if there are no any questions, so let's just go ahead to, I will, in the next, I will introduce you to first our research guide about the standards. And next I will show you how to do the act the search actually on the ASTM um, Compass database, which Matt just introduced in the slides. So first, let's uh, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the our library's main website. So it's very simple URL. So it's just library.cmu.edu. So after you are at the main web page of the CMU library's website, then you will find there's a red banner here. So they, here are some of the quick links that, um, that, are, that have the most important uh, resources in our libraries and also the services and programs. So the first one, you can see there's a research guides there. So let's just click that. So then it will open a new page. And as just as Matt just mentioned, we can just type the standard here and enter here. And then you can see that that's the um, standards research guide that we have at the CMU libraries. So we, if we just click that standard and then you can see, so this is the main page of the standards research guide. So under the home page, you can see some instructions about the navigation to help to help you navigate this standards research guide. And then it gives some um, important definitions and also the reason why we have the standards and also some additional information. And also you can see there are some additional like digital collections in our libraries and how to find the standards and how to request a standard we don't own. And also there are some COVID-19 related standards. So yeah, so here, this is how you can uh, get access to our standards research guide and also to find help related to the standards. Okay, are there any questions so far about the standards research guide? Okay, so if there are no questions, I'm just going to next directly show you how to perform um, the most efficient searching strategies in the ASTM Compass databases. So in order to visit the ASTM, we can just do the same thing here. 
And the, on the right-hand side, there's a search bar here. I can just type ASTM here. And then you can see here, so there's a quick link towards the ASTM compass. So as introduced uh, previously by Matt, you can see the ASTM compass is a collection of the industry leading standards um, in the technical engineering information in a broad range of engineering disciplines. So let's just click that. And then it will redirect us to the main search page for the ASTM compass standards database. So here you can see this is a, the, uh, the main interface, the search interface for the ASTM compass. And then you can see all of the um, relevant information. And if you are on, off campus, it will ask you for like to ask you to log in through the CMU um, identification to make sure that you are a CMU user. And then after you were logged in into the ASTM compass, you will see that uh, you, you get, will actually see this, this Carnegie Mellon University Library. So it means that you are already uh, logged in to the CMU library authentication. Yeah, so next, um, I'm just going to do a quick search here. And since we don't sub at the CMU libraries, we don't subscribe all of the compass because all of the standards, because the standards are quite expensive. So that's, we, so that due to the funding and budgets, so we, we are not able to subscribe at every standard they have available. So, but we do have the all of the most important standards available for you to yeah to uh, use and uh, to um, to conduct the research. And here next, I'm just selecting the my subscription here. And then since uh, robotics, I think it's a very emerging field right now. So I'm just going to do a quick search to find the standards related to the robots. Okay. So next, this the database is searching right now. And then you can see all of the uh, searching results related to the robots. And on the left-hand side, you can see additional refining options that can allow you to further refine your search to find the most relevant uh, searching results. So you can refine the results based by um, based on the publisher and also the categories and also the technical committee and topic, industry sector, and ISC. ICS code. Yeah. So here we're just going to visit the first, the top search result, which is the standard terminology for evaluating the response robot capabilities. So this is one of the um, in important standards types, which is uh, defining the terminology for certain areas of, uh, of focus. So you can see here, this, that is uh, how it usually looks like. So I'm just going to um, make sure that this is the fully, yeah. So this should be, be a good looking way. So then you can see here, so this is the, the basic format, how it looks like for actual standard. So on the top hand side, you can see the, uh, the logo of the uh, publishing unit, which is the ASTM International. And then you can see the, uh, the title, which is the standard terminology for evaluating response robot capabilities. And then you can see some additional like explanation about this standard. Yeah. And then usually followed by the title is a general introduction to this standard. So you can see the robotics community needs ways to quantitatively measure whether a particular robot is capable of performing and reliable enough to perform specific missions. So that basically uh, introduces the background of this standard. And you can also see some additional like uh, introduction about the overall set of the standards addresses the robotic terminology, safety, maneuvering, terrains, and also, and so on. So followed by the introduction, this is also give, the standard will also give an overall coverage, also the scope of the standard. So you can see this terminology identifies then precisely defines the terms as used in the standard test methods and practices and guides for evaluating response robots intended for hazardous environments. So that gives a clear scope of this standards terminology. And next you can also follow by the scope, you have find the detailed. So that's the probably the most uh, important part is the actual terminology de definitions for the standards. For example, 
you can see all of the like the verbs and the nouns that are related to the um, response robots capabilities. For example, the verb, the abstain, uh, means that the robot manufacturer or this designated operator declaring not to perform a particular test or not to have the test result disseminated. And you can see another important terminology in the uh, response robots capabilities, which is the aspect ratio, the ratio of width to height of an image produced by a camera system. Yeah, so, and also you can see there's another one is the uh, image acuity, the measure of the resolving capability of the robot's camera system. Yeah, so you can see all of the uh, important and relevant terminologies in evaluating the response robot's capabilities. Yeah, so you can, we can just move on quickly. And then you can see uh, other important terminologies like the remote control and also the uh, robot, of course, and also the sensor fusion. And uh, yeah, so that's that's the general overall structure of the how the like the standards, the ter terminology looks like. So that's the overall structure of the us uh, of the terminology standards types. Are there any questions so far about this type of standard? Okay, so if there are no questions, we can actually see if you see on the like the tab side, the, the top tab, you can see there are additional tabs. For example, the HTML would give you more like a web version of the standards. So you can see that's um, an alternative to the PDF uh, version of the standards. And also that's the one you can see the related content. So that's basically, it is similar to like um, to a literature, like a scholarly literature, like a research article. They will usually have some related articles based on the references uh, to that specific articles. So here you can see, these are the standard references. So it, it contains a comprehensive list of citations to this standard. So these are all of the relevant um, standards that can uh, that are yeah that are related to this standard terminology for evaluating response robot capabilities. Here we can just take a quick look at the first one. So it's about the standard test method for evaluating response robot sensing visual acuity. I think we just uh, we just saw that visual acuity in the uh, in that standard terminology. Yeah, article. So here you can see here. So that's the the full text of the standard test method for evaluating response robot sensing about the visual acuity. So you can see they generally follow the same similar formats like the previous one. You can see this, it has the publishing unit, which is STM International on the top left hand side, and then you can see the standard the title right below the uh, the uh, publishing units logo, and then some, and then the introduction. So you can see this standards is about the robotics community needs ways to measure whether a particular robot is capable of performing specific missions in unstructured and also often the hazardous environments. So it lays out a background for this standard and why they are designing this specific standard. Yeah, so that's the, and it also additionally introduces the, the committee, the publishing units who are actually designing this, who already designed this standard. So it's the ASTM International Standards Committee on Homeland Security Applications specify standards test methods and practices for evaluating individual robot capabilities. Yeah, and then it also lays out the importance and the significance of this standard. The overall suite of standards addresses critical subsystems of remotely operated response robots, including maneuvering, mobility, and also the safety and terminology. So yeah, so you can see, it also follows the same structure by first laying out the scope, the, uh, the overall coverage of the standard. The purpose of this test method is to specify the apparatuses, procedures, and the performance metrics necessary to quantitatively measure a robot's visual acuity as displayed to a remote operator or vision algorithm. So that's the about the scope of this standard. 
And next, you can see these are also additional like um, parameters and also additional um, like uh, terminologies that are useful for this uh, specific standard. Yeah. So you can also see there are some additional like uh, notes. For example, it specifies that this standard does not purport to address all of these safety concerns, if any, associated with this use. So it also gives some limitations about this standard. Okay, so you can see uh, the second one is some additional reference documents that this standard already um, refers to. For example, it uh, refers to the ASTM standards, the terminology for evaluating the response robot capabilities that I just, um, just introduced in the last standard, and also it has some additional standards that are also relevant to this standard, like the photography, electronic steel picture imaging. Yeah. So yeah, so next followed by the, um, the reference documents, you can see the terminology. So some additional terminology, like uh, this following terms are used in this test method and are defined in the terminology. Yes. So. So followed by this, uh, this terminologies, we can move on forward, and then you can see, we can see the detailed summary of the test method performed for this standard. For example, you can see this test method uses standard symbols of incrementally small sizes viewed by robots from specified distances to measure the far field and also near field visual acuity of the each onboard camera. And uh, next, you can see some additional justification and the significance for these standards. For example, uh, it says that various levels of visual acuity are essential when the remotely operating robots in unstructured and often hazardous environments. Yeah. So followed by the significance, they will also have some accompanying uh, pictures because picture is always much better than uh, the words itself because it can give you a direct sense of how this uh, standard test is performed. So you can see there's a clear, like you can see a robot on the ground, and then you can see a, a, pic, a list of pictures that can test the, uh, the robot's camera's visual acuity. So you can see this is um, the picture A is an example of a far field visual acuity chart as viewed by a robot six meters away and displayed on a remote operator interface. And then you can so in the middle is the standard symbols to identify and are also called land towards rings with gaps in any of the eight different orientations. And also you can see on the right hand side, the, uh, the photograph shows the, um, the QR codes are also used to evaluate the acuity of autonomous systems with imaging processing capabilities. So yeah, so this um, photographs are very helpful for for you for the readers to understand the actual testing situation and also their surrounding environments. Yeah, so you can see additionally, there are some of the baseline image used for purposes of comparisons. So you can see these are different um, different distance situations. You can see the three images of the same scene with the same image resolution. So you can see the top row shows field of view increasing from left to right. And while the bottom row shows acuity decreasing, yeah, so you can see there's a clear resolution difference based on the distance. Yeah. So there are some additional images. And then you can see an additional example. For example, this chart, in this chart, this is showing an, a robot positioned in front of the visual acuity test apparatus. So you can see the the robots on the ground, and you can see the uh, like a camera right above the robots, and also the actual testing interface right in front of the robots. So this is a very straightforward and also very helps the readers to understand the actual circumstances, testing situations. Yeah. So you can see these are additional. Uh, terminologies, including apparatus used in the testing environments. So yeah, so we can just move on. And then we can see also, you might encounter some uh, relevant formula to calculate the percentage. 
For example, the percentage of human vision is 100 times the chart distance times tangent 1 over 60 degrees and divided by length or the ring gap size. So that's the formula to calculate the percent, percentage of the human vision. And additionally, you can see some additional like drawings about the relative dimensions of the human readable symbol used to measure the visual acuity of systems. Yeah, so you can see this very helpful to uh, help you dive into the actual testing uh, situations. If you want to replicate that specific um, testing by yourself, yeah, so there are some additional levels of acuity with relative percentage of average human vision at various distances. Yeah. So yeah, so moving forward, we can also see some additional charts that are also relevant to this testing. And next, you can see the actual procedures. Like for, for example, the procedure ensures that the apparatus and environmental conditions are set up properly according to the apparatus section six, and also to ensure that the robot system configuration has been identified and documented. Yeah, so these are some just some additional like suggestions and tips about this testing specifically. Yeah. All right, so we can just move on and then we can see there's another section about the calculation of the results. So you can, for example, um, you can count and tabulate the total number of successful repetitions and faults based on the results. And then you can see some uh, additional formulas to calculate the horizontal and also the vertical field of view. Yeah. So yeah, so you can see, and also followed by the calculations, it will also specify some precision and a bias in the calculation and also the testing of this, um, the response robots visual acuity. For example, the, about the precision of visual acuity tests. So the visual acuity test charts on quantiz uh, quantized, quantized. So the measurement reported is the smallest line that can be read. So re Repeatability tests show that almost all operators will report one of two adjacent values. So yeah, so this also help for to help you identify some like arrows and precisions about the this test. Yeah, so it's also very helpful, and also some additional some considerations about the bias. Yeah, and also some measurement uncertainties. Yeah, so followed by this. Um, this will also include some appendix appendixes. So if so, this will include some additional terminologies and also the discussions that are relevant to this uh, specific testing standard. Yeah. So yeah, so we can just move on forward to give a quick look at this additional terminologies. And uh, after that, you can also see uh, the tables and also figures in the appendixes. For example, the test results for sensors based on visual acuity. So it gives some um, example of their, their testing, like, like for example, the robot A. So it has a test distance of six meters and average acuity of 3.9 millimeters and the standard deviation with 0.0 millimeters. So these are some of test, test results for their standard testing. And also, this is also very helpful because it is basically like um, actual testing sheet that the, they used, the, uh, the writers for this standards used to actually test this, um, test their response robots. So you can see this is the designed by the National Institute of Science Standards and Technology. And also you can see the standard test methods for response robots. And you can see, um, yeah, so this is actually a um, testing sheet that you can utilize if you are actually testing one of the response robots, visual acuity. So you can see, you can write the robot make, the model, and all of the relevant information about the response robots, and also the um, some uh, accompanying uh, images that are helpful for the testing. And also here are some actual detailed like form that you can fill out to actually to test the visual acuity of the response robots. So yeah, so that's how it looks like, the overall structure of the uh, standard 
for the um, for the testing type, the testing standards type. So yeah, so this is basically um, concludes my uh, my parts about the introduction to the uh, STM Compass database and also the two uh, two main standards type, including these uh, terminology type and also the testing type of the standard.